It's a well-known fact of life that we all love a good Reddit thread here at Crispy's Tavern. And this time, guys, I got myself a doozy for you because I found a thread of the worst homebrew rules and rulings that players and dungeon masters have ever seen in their game. So without further ado, guys, we're going to go through some really, truly terrible Reddit DM ruling, some really bad DMing in general, and seeing if there's anything positive, anything at all that we can learn from this. We're known for taking the best out of the worst here. So without further ado, guys, let's get started. I had a DM who wouldn't remind us of anything out of game. Even if we just forgot as people, he would punish our characters. Couldn't remember the NPC's name? You're being disrespectful. And they won't talk to you anymore. Didn't make a note of the town you're traveling to? Then you can't find it on the map, let alone travel there. God, it was unbearable at times. At times, that sounds unbearable all the time. Some DMs really become sticklers about metagaming. I think metagaming is not ideal. If you're unaware, metagaming is using out-of-game knowledge in-game. Essentially, if your character doesn't know about something but the player does, the player may accidentally use that out-of-game knowledge to influence their in-game decisions. Therefore, metagaming. It's considered bad form. And again, I don't think it's ideal. But some DMs really take it to the next dang level when it comes to preventing metagaming, to the point where it becomes a whole problem in and of itself. Look, it's not a problem if your players need to ask you what the name of an NPC is. It's not their job to memorize every little aspect of your world. Now, don't get me wrong. I love it when my players remember stuff. Like, I like it when my players care about what my world has in it. The characters, the locations, etc. But... First and foremost, it is partially on me to create something memorable for them to remember in the first place because, let's be honest, sometimes we don't hit the mark as dungeon masters. That's okay. We need to cater to what our players like, what we like as DMs, but also, again, what they like. Both are important. And if you do that, they're going to be more likely to remember what you're putting in front of them. But also, people sometimes just forget things, okay? It's not a crime. Usually, you're playing once a week. That's seven whole days between you and the next game. That's seven whole days for your players to forget things. Some people have to play every month. Some people have to play every few weeks, etc., etc. This degree of separation is going to require in people forgetting some details. Using that as an excuse to make the game more inconvenient, not just for the players, but for you to run as well, is dumb. It's stupid. Don't do this. The point is, yeah, metagaming is not ideal, but out-of-game knowledge or reminding players of in-game knowledge, out-of-game, stuff like that, it's not really that big of a deal. Come on. Marshals can't get advantage unless it's granted by a spell. Which you rogues pissed off this DM. I know it was one of you guys, but yeah, it's not the rogues' fault. I actually inadvertently nerfed rogues in my own campaign. I thought that rogues needed to stand in a flanking maneuver with the monsters. One guy here, one guy here, monster in the middle. I thought that's how it worked. I thought that's how sneak attack was done. I thought they had to have advantage. I didn't realize that rogues could just stand next to an ally and get the same effect. Me and my players decided to keep this change, however, because we thought it was fun. It wasn't a massive nerf at the end of the day. Yeah, sometimes the rogue would need to burn a cunning action to get a dash to be in proper positioning, but this change results in our rogue and our monk being way more strategic with their movements, and so we decided to keep it. The point is that I don't think every change to rogue is a bad thing. Obviously, I made one accidentally myself that my players ended up enjoying, and hey, maybe the players will enjoy this change as well, but it's still really silly. Not only does it nerf rogues, but it nerfs marshals in general. I'm gonna be honest, the amount of times marshals get advantage on a hit is not super high, and the amount of times marshals miss in my games it's also not super high, so this isn't the worst nerf ever, but at the same time, it's still unfair. I'm assuming spellcasters can still get advantage from a variety of sources, not just spells. So yeah, it makes marshals way too reliant on spellcasters. It's a change that nerfs one class in a heavy way, nerfs a bunch of classes in a minor way, and makes them all reliant on another set of classes in a way that's just not going to make the game more fun in general. I think encouraging teamwork is good, but this kind of reliance that's not great. The DM was secretly rolling saves, which means he's not, so we're all taking mysterious damage. This goes on for three sessions, and I finally threatened to rage quit. Why am I taking damage? I'm tired of this crap. If you don't tell me, I'm leaving. Magical poison. 
I'm immune. Even if you conveniently forgot, I'm a dwarf wizard. My saves for poison plus magic are unfailable. Whew. So yeah, don't do this. I thought this was just about DMs rolling, like, saving throws for monsters behind the screen, which, as I was reading this, I was thinking, that's normal. What DM doesn't roll behind the screen? Almost everyone does that. But this DM was rolling the player's saves behind the screen, which, okay, not good at all for a variety of reasons. Number one, I like it when my players are physically doing something at the table. I like it when my players are moving their own tokens, when they're rolling dice, etc. I mean, look, role playing is great, but there's something about like actually doing something on the game board, whether it be a VTT or a physical board, that's fun. People like rolling dice. Taking that away from players is one, annoying for me as a DM because I need to like spam dice behind the screen, and two, makes the players less engaged. They have less stuff to do even if it's just a single dice roll. And on top of that, yeah, this DM is cheating. <laughs> the DM is essentially cheating to make sure the players fail certain saves. Yeah, maybe your epic legendary action didn't affect the players in as big of a way as you thought it would because they all miraculously succeeded. And I get how that can be kind of disappointing at times. As a dungeon master, I run with Flea Mortals and Matt Koba's Flea Mortals has epic villain actions that change the battle in giant ways, but sometimes, those villain actions are a saving throw, and sometimes all the players succeed, and therefore it doesn't do much. And yeah, that happens. But does it happen often enough that I'm gonna put a change like this into play? No. It takes interactivity away from the players, takes agency away from the players, and makes the DM way too responsible for their roles. And on top of that, the DM is using this to cheat, which, as we've covered many, many times already, come on. That's lame. You're literally god of this world. You shouldn't celebrate beating a bunch of players. A dungeon master who constantly insisted on damaging my equipment. Every attack punched a hole in my shield. Every fight resulted in my chainmail getting shredded. And I was never allowed to fully repair my armor, only improvised patchwork that mechanically downgraded it. As the only strength-based character, it was not fun. Shit. I'm getting a theme here. What's with all you guys nerfing martial characters? I mean, it's not you guys, but like, what's up with bad DMs nerfing martial characters? Stop it. But look, when you are dealing with durability, I uh, don't like that. If you ever talk to me about video games ever, you'll know that I generally despise durability systems. When I'm playing Minecraft, I want mending as soon as possible. The reason Tears of the Kingdom is my game of the year is because it has a system, a durability system, that I hate, and yet I still end up absolutely falling in love with the game despite it, hence why I hold it in such high regards. The point is, I really don't like durability systems, and in D&D, it can work in theory, but I think it often just adds inconvenience to a game where you're already doing a lot. Maybe in a game where the players aren't really engaging with the content that much, maybe this can make them engage more because they need to repair their armor, they need to go into town to get things done, etc, etc, etc. But in most games, honestly, I find myself running out of time to fit things into a session. I often don't find myself needing to fill up session time with stuff like repairing equipment, especially since there's more fun things to do out there. This kind of goes hand in hand with stuff like critical fumble tables. It's just an inconvenience. Like, yeah, I get how it can be enjoyable, but even as a guy who really likes a more hardcore game, I would rather it be more dependent on what the players are doing. Here, the guy is taking damage for his armor and weapons just by using them. With critical fumble tables, you're just getting unlucky. I feel like that's not really a skill thing, that's just you're doing stuff and crappy things are happening to you because that's the way I designed the game. Also, it obviously disproportionately affects a martial character in comparison to their spell casting brethren, which as apparently I'm gonna need to say multiple times in this video, is stupid. Stop nerfing marshals, like what the heck guys, quit it. Once you meet slash beat a target's AC, you no longer have to roll to hit them. You learned how to hit them once, so you can reliably hit them again. This also worked for the enemies. This sounds like a feature from another system that actually could be very interesting. Like, maybe instead of hit points, which are really low, AC is the thing that you whittle down over time until eventually you crack through the AC or you crack through the monster's tactics in order to get at that juicy health bar. I don't know, it could be fun, but um, not for D&D. D&D was not designed around that system and therefore it's not going to work. This is an example of a sweeping major change. Again, to some DMs, this might sound really cool and unique. Oh my god, it's gonna make me not like other girls. But the problem is, when you make your game too much not like other girls, it becomes a little bit not just unrecognizable, but broken. 
I was designing for a long time Tales from the Tavern, a rewrite of D&D's origin system and a few other things, and I really enjoyed it. But I had to be very, very careful. I had to tiptoe around a lot of D&D's features because game design is hard, and I'm an amateur. I'm some fool. I'm not Matt Colville, not Matt Mercer. I'm just some idiot who thinks he can make something. So yeah, it was hard for me to do that, and I was really trying to stray away from making sweeping major changes to combat like this one. Even though, yeah, maybe it was tempting to integrate some cool online ruling that seems interesting, it's different when you're actually playing it out in game. Now this one, just off the rip, sounds really silly when you take into account how D&D works, but a lot of new dungeon masters aren't aware of that, which is why I often caution new dungeon masters against going too heavily into homebrew rulings before they get some experience with how the system works. My DM, for whatever reason, thought casters were underpowered and allowed them to cast cantrips and first level spells as bonus actions and actions. It made marshals feel useless and the warlock suddenly became nuts. Okay, yeah, it is gonna be a theme. Quit it. So yeah, spellcasters as a class are often perceived frequently by new players or new dungeon masters to be underpowered due to the spell slot system, especially if you start at first level. And I understand that because I was like this. When I first heard about Dungeons and Dragons and heard about the spell slot system, I was like, wow, that sounds so stupid. I'm only gonna be able to cast like one spell per day. I'm never gonna be able to do anything. But then I actually like got into the game and realized, I often don't need to cast that many spells per day, and you also have quite a bit of spell slots, so at the end of the day, you've got a good amount to work with. This fits the same lesson as the last point, so I'm not going to harp too much on it, but again, a sweeping major change. Seems small, but instead of just expanding like the flexibility of spellcasters, you made them blatantly overpowered, with warlocks being able to spam cast Eldritch Blast with their bonus action, which is terrifying. It could be interesting to integrate these changes, make an insanely overpowered D&D &D game where you're all playing as gods or something, but like we've seen in previous stories, we have martial characters just left in the dust here. Apparently people just really don't care about them, which is a heartbreaking thing to see because if anything, I think martials need the most love. Often they're reduced to just hitting things in combat when they should be getting maneuvers, battle tactics, etc, etc to make their combat more interesting. I'm hoping to integrate this myself, though it is a slow process because like I said, I'm trying not to make sweeping major changes to the game in fear of affecting it too much. This DM was clear not worrying about that and their game paid the price every crit table we were being attacked by 15 monsters the chances of an enemy crit is absurdly higher than the players so a goblin rolled a 20 on my level 14 tank the dm rolled a d100 across the table got 100 looked at the table 100 means insta kill so my barbarian with more than 100 hit points with slash resistance died from a goblin throwing knife with 1d4 damage on top of the fact that some of the critical hit effects can be a lot, I'm of the opinion that monsters rolling double damage already transforms how a combat works. It can really, really shift the balance. I mean, a couple weeks ago, I had some spider swarms roll a couple miraculous nat 20s against our paladin, and it went from a really easy fight to a fight that they might not walk out of. I mean, they did end up surviving, but it was really, really tense and really, really close, all because of a couple nat 20s. Toss critical hit effects on there that are too much for players to bear, and if I was to toss critical hit effects that I wasn't balance checking because I'm not reading the whole table because there's a hundred options, then ugh, I just don't even want to think about what kind of disaster that would be. Look, I don't have a problem with injury tables on principle. I don't even have a problem with these critical hit, critical fumble tables on principle. I just, even though they have their flaws, just make sure to read them at the very least. Make sure you read all the options and make sure you know how they're going to affect your game. Because if you don't, you might end up killing a barbarian at level 14 with over 100 hit points with a d4 knife. Woof! This one was pretty fun. This thread got really popular, so I might do this again. We have so many we might do this agains in the pipeline, but you know what? It's a problem for another day. If you guys enjoyed them, please do a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our RPG Horror Story series, where we cover the best of worst Dungeons & Dragons, it's linked to the cards, and while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. Actually, leave a specific comment. What's the worst house rule you've ever seen? To let me know you made it to the end of the video. But anyway, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell.